Thank you very much, um, uh, Ashish, uh, for uh, inviting me to uh, uh, to talk to your students. I can't tell you um, uh, how much of a pleasure this is for uh, a person like me. As I told you um, on the phone when we last spoke, I'm in some meeting or the other throughout the day. And so I actually look forward to talking to, um, to students because I'm not able to do that. I haven't been able to do that much over the last two years. Uh, since I took over um, the law school uh, where I am where I am now, uh, and I think uh, so. This is a welcome opportunity for me. So um, this is something that I'm really looking forward to. So thank you for that, and thank you to Murli for uh, connecting us. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, you know that's uh, these are the kind of serendipitous uh, serendipitous events that lead to uh, to something like this. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'm uh, this is going to be an Ashish has promised that this will be. Um, um, an informal session uh, in the sense that there will be a lot of give and take um, and there will be lots of interaction. And I want to keep it that way because um, uh, the, the topic is otherwise daunting, for certainly for me, but also for the students as well. Um, I'll uh, let, let me uh, give a brief, what I'll do today is I'll give a brief introduction to uh, where I come from. And, um, and then I'll talk about what Ashish wanted me to uh, talk about. Uh, but before that, I want to tell you that uh, my where I'm staying now, we have uh, uh, three, um, I suppose I should call entities, just to make it cover everything. Uh, three entities in my house. One is a very excitable teenager, uh, very excitable dog, and uh, uh, a very uh, busy lawyer. Which is my wife, so you're going to you might have a lot of uh, uh, interruptions in between. So I'm, I apologize in in advance. Uh, there may be some uh, random yells and yelps and discussions in the background. So you should, you should please excuse me if that happens. That's just all in a day's work because of the pandemic. We're all sitting at home and working together. Uh, my my house basically sounds like a call center during the day. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry for that. And I hope that uh, I've told, I've warned people that this is an important talk and lecture, uh, but uh, not many people take me seriously in my household. So it could be that uh, they ignore my pleas. So with that, uh, with that caveat, let me start. Um, my name is uh, uh, NS Nigam. I'm, I'm variously called as NS Nigam and Nigam Nugeharli. Uh, the latter part necessitated by my long years abroad. I was 16 years abroad, 10 years in New York and six years in New York and 10 years in London. And uh, and then, uh, you know, NS Nigam doesn't work very well there. They need a first name and a last name. So it became Nigam Nugeheli. Nugeheli is a small town in Karnataka where my ancestors came from. I have only visited it once. Uh, it's famous for a very, uh, very uh, historic temple. Um, yeah, in, uh, that's what it's traditionally famous for. But now it's even more famous because it's only about 10 kilometers away from uh, our former prime minister H.T. Devegora's uh, hometown. So, uh, so there are. So, but I, you know, as I said, my that, the, the reason that I have that name is is because of passport reasons uh, in uh, in my travels abroad. Uh, I uh, went to the National Law School, Bangalore, uh, and I was the fifth batch, so one of the kind of early batches of the National Law School when it was the only NLU. It, it wasn't like one of 20 now that it was the only first NLU to start in India uh, and, and the first uh, national law school to uh, or the first law school to kind of combine liberal arts and uh, uh, law, right? I'm trying to, I'm trying to get uh, lawyers interested in subjects outside their domain right from their education. Right? And, and, and I'm giving this background because that's what resulted in a lot of us being interested in the humanities. I mean, the first three years of our lives, uh, we were taught varying degrees of quality of teaching, but we were taught um, economics, history, sociology, political science. And kind of because we were taught all these subjects in our undergrad, we were just out of uh, high school, um, it kind of stayed with us. You know, that whatever you were taught in the first three years of law school, uh, it really stays with you. Whatever you're taught in the last two years of law school, you're hardly in the classes or you're hardly listening. So these first three years um, were crucial for us. Right? And uh, I remember, I, to this day, I remember that uh, my political science classes uh, were extraordinarily um, fascinating for me. As, uh, and I, I, I was just a, a law student who had just learned constitutional law, but then I was taught uh, Hobbes and 
Rousseau and Locke and their ideas on, on, on politics. And it was an extraordinary time for a student to be sitting in, 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 a, in a classroom and learning about those um, famous authors and struggling with their ideas, uh, which is what resulted in my uh, kind of my interest in philosophy, right? in particular political philosophy. Um, so uh, as soon as I left law school, I went abroad. I was, um, I was uh, I, for my sins, I was a tax lawyer in, in New York for, uh, for several years and then in London as well, before I decided to go into academia. And when I went to um, uh, Oxford, uh, I again decided to, even though my background and my experience has been in tax, I decided to specialize my thesis, my PhD thesis in um, political and legal philosophy. <clears throat> and so I learned, I was particularly taken by uh, Ronald Watkins uh, philosophy. He's a, uh, he's a famous political and legal philosopher. Uh, and I, I was particularly interested in his philosophy and I learned a lot, a great deal. In fact, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what he's done in this class as well. And uh, I think those years in doing political philosophy and moral philosophy and legal philosophy in Oxford really sh helped shape my thinking, not just in philosophy, but in all other areas that I was interested in, including tax law. And, and that um, uh, it brings me to my topic today, because uh, Ashish uh, has said that uh, we must uh, ask our students th that question before we start teaching them philosophy. We must ask, why should we teach philosophy? Why should we learn philosophy? Right? And it's it's interesting. I think economists ask pretty much the same question as lawyers do. I don't know if Ashish does this, but in my, I teach legal, whenever I teach legal philosophy, I ask my students, uh, why should we learn philosophy? Why should we learn, in their case, legal philosophy? And uh, the question I, I kind of take off on what another famous legal philosopher called H.L.A. Hart said, which is that it's not common for other disciplines to worry about philosophy, right? So, for example, bus drivers don't learn about the philosophy of bus driving. A lot of doctors don't worry about the philosophy of medicine. I mean, they may take it an optional course, but it's not a mandatory course. Uh, in law schools, by the way, unlike in economics, jurisprudence, legal philosophy, is a mandatory course. Right? It's mandated by the BCI, but it's much the same in other countries. In the, U in, in the UK, it's a mandatory course in Oxford. And in the US, while it is not a mandatory course, pretty much every student ends up taking legal philosophy. And so there must be some reason for it. Why is, that, why is it that um, people, why, why are we so interested in the nature of the law for us to become lawyers? Right? And I'm sure that a similar question can be asked in the economics domain itself. So why is it, what is there about economics um, that's so important that we need to study some philosophy, not just philosophy, not just economic philosophy, but just philosophy in general. Now there are plenty of reasons. So, that, so now I come to this topic finally, which is why must we, why must we all learn philosophy, right? And there are plenty of reasons for uh, learning philosophy. I mean, I mean, there are uh, the, the universe of reasons for it is, is never ending. But I particularly, particularly like three reasons. I, I think there are three, kind of for me, compelling reasons why we must uh, learn philosophy and uh, I think we will go through those uh, here. So um, I, I, I said um, when Ashish and I talked on the phone, I, um, I, uh, I told Ashish, uh, I'm a, you know, are we supposed to do a PowerPoint presentation or something? And Ashish said, listen, please don't do all these things. Uh, you know, we want the students to learn and not to look at PowerPoint presentations. And I, and I, you know, I can't help myself. I'm so I, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, Ashish. But I have, you know, I have a word document that I want our students uh, to see, and and I promise you that I'm doing that only in the aid of trying to make them uh, think about uh, uh, about philosophy, right? And I'm doing that, um, uh, and, and these will be accessible. So, uh, so these are not going to be these are hopefully not going to complicate matters anymore, right? So I'm going to show you three texts today um, in the course of this this talk and i would prefer if people talk right if, if people come and and, uh, and and respond to what i'm trying to do right? it will just be more interesting so then my first i'll, I'll show you a text first 
Um, just give me one second. Okay. Now I hope that there you are. Can everyone see this? This is why should we study philosophy? Ashish, can you see it? Just can you just tell me if you can see it? Yes, absolutely. We all right. can. So if you just I'll just call this up so you don't need this. This is a text from a 10th standard civics paper in ICSC. And it is, um, uh, I just want you to read this. I just want our, our students to read this and tell me what they make of it. Right? This is a 10th standard ICSC civics. So some of your students might actually remember this already. Some of your particularly studious students will remember this. So I want uh, you to tell me um, what you make of this. Just just read it for a sec for a, for a couple of minutes, and uh, I'll just give you a couple of minutes to read, and then tell me uh, tell me tell me if you find it interesting. Let's start with that. Tell me whether you find this interesting. Personally, I find it I, mm. I shouldn't be uh, negative, I suppose, but I find it disjointed and I have lots of questions for having read it. Hmm. Yeah. So let's, I mean, let's, let's start talking about this. I, I this is the, um, unfortunately, this is the most interesting part of this book. So uh, it only gets worse after this. So after this, there's a whole column and which state represents which seat in which parliament. And then there's a whole other column describing each state and its people. I mean, I after that, I, mean, I nearly went off to sleep looking at this. And then I kind of completely went off uh, after I read the next few pages. This is our 10th grade civics um, chapter one, right? So the first thing is, uh, I mean, the topic here is why do we uh, need philosophy? And this is item number one for you. I think we need philosophy because whatever is given to us in whatever form, I mean, you will, your students will see a lot of economic texts of this sort as well. Whatever is given to you in this form, philosophy will make it interesting and accessible. So, for example, there's no point talking about, you know, parliament is uh, not only a law making body. What is the meaning of how does one make law? Why is it a parliament, a law making body? That's the first question that might come to you in your mind. Second question is our parliament is a true representation of we, the people of India. Really, is it a true representation? First of all, why do we need representation at all? If I were a student, my question would be, why does the first page of a textbook, talk about representation, when I don't know why representation is important. Why should we be represented? Is there some great democratic idea here, some interesting idea about democracy, the nature of democracy that makes representation crucial to it? Second, why is it that something has to be a true representation? How, how what, what makes something a true representation? Uh, if our parties can win uh, the parliament, a majority of the seats, by having 30% of, the, of, the, of the electoral um, numbers, then uh, how is it a true representation? Right? Um, similarly, when we say that, if you go, go to the last paragraph, and you say, in countries where, the, where people belong to different races or regions with their own customs and languages, federation seems to be the only plan to keep them united. Why is that? That raises a lot of interesting questions for me. And the answer, and the examples given is the French and the English 
who apparently disagreed very strongly with each other until they joined together in a federation. Are we saying that this is just to ensure it is a federal setup, uh, uh, something like a, something like you know, uh, people getting together for their material reasons just so that they can uh, you know somehow live coexist side by side. Is that the only reason for uh, somebody being in a federation? I, I think these are fundamental questions that are fundamental to the idea of a political community. What political community means? Why do we need politics? What does uh, democracy mean? Is democracy meant in a very instrumental sense, in the sense that it kind of gets ensures that conflicts are somehow managed? Or does it have any inherent um, value in it? If so, what is that inherent value? Those are not questions that are um, peripheral to the discussion, or those, those are not questions that you can set aside and then come and read this. Right? Those are questions that you need at least to kind of engage with in order to understand this, and more importantly, most importantly, in order to find this interesting. Otherwise, this is uh, this is basically death by democracy. I mean, you're looking at this at this. Uh, as these passages, and you are just going to nod off after some time. You're not going to be at all excited about reading civics. Right? I wasn't excited about reading civics when I was a kid, and I see the same thing happening to our kids uh, today. Right? So the first thing I think we should, do when somebody tells me, "Why should you?" Now I'm going to close this so that I can I can uh, talk to you. So the first thing that I say to people. First thing I say is that um, why should you study philosophy? My first answer is it makes your life interesting. Right? It makes whatever you study interesting. You can't otherwise be invested in a subject if you don't philosophize about it. Right? The, the literal idea of philosophy is uh, love of wisdom. Right? That's what philosophy means. Um, and. Uh, that's fine, but that doesn't give you, that's the definition, but that doesn't tell you why you need to learn philosophy or why you need to be interested in philosophy. Philosophy, the first reason in my opinion, and I'm going to give you three reasons today, and as I said, those are not the only three reasons, but these are three reasons that I, I particularly like, is that it makes things interesting and accessible. It makes whatever you read interesting and accessible. I've given you an example from, uh, from law and politics, but you, I'm sure, will have your own examples that are applicable to uh, to economics. Somebody has said, which definition of democracy are they basing this on? And those are precisely the kind of question that you should be asking uh, when you're uh, when you're when you're reading this text, right? You shouldn't be asking, how do I mug up the number of states that are there in the parliament? You should be asking, what kind of, what definition of democracy do you have? Like what what do you say rep true representation of we the people? What kind of uh, how is that important? In a democracy, there is no true representation. I'll give you the answer straight away, and there's no we the people in India. But if that is the case, then why are we talking about it in a civics textbook? Right? So those are the important um, things, questions that should come to your mind, and those questions are not coming to your mind post the discussion on civics. Right? Those questions are there in order for you to have a gateway into the subject, without thinking that subject is the most boring thing ever. Right? That's the reason why. You need to uh, have some engagement. Now, in Adya's, uh, I'm assuming Adya is, is, is she a student of the class, Ashish? Yes, she is okay. a TYBSC student. Sorry, a TYBSC student. And here, BSc. All right, right. And um, and um, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm laughing because um, somebody said C CBSC civics books were great though, and he's. Praneet is absolutely right. I'm a CBSC, I was a CBSC student, and he's absolutely right. These ICSC people, they just think that their books are interesting. They're not. The CBSC guys are the best. I agree with you completely, Praneet. And in fact, um, when I started, when I was at Azim Premji University before I came over here, we, uh, uh, we had started a project called Teaching Democracy, where we went to schools in Bangalore and we taught concepts of democracy to students. And we realized that the 10th, 11th, and 12th CBC books on democracy are actually quite good. 
uh, and quite interesting because they're very interesting i didn't put them here there's no point in talking about it, about what i wanted to say so i put the icac uh, textbook just to show you how boring some of the textbooks can, can be but i agree with you some of the cbc textbooks actually on politics are very interesting and and quite well written. so i'm just coming back to adya so adya um, um, has raised another interesting <laughs> uh, so so is my daughter so uh, uh, the uh, Adya has raised a very interesting um, point, by the way, um, which is going to be my third point when I when I'm going to reach that. So keep keep track of that what I'm saying, Adya, because in, you actually in, in raising this issue, you've uh, answered what's happening in the first point that I'm making, but you have also kind of flagging what I'm going to be saying in my third uh, point as well about philosophy. So just keep that in mind, Adya. So don't don't go off anywhere. Right? So um, now that's the first reason. Now the second reason, and I'm going to show you another text uh, for that, and you will see now what I'm talking about. Now this, by the way, I have recently mentioned in my letter to law students, which I think uh, sometimes Ashish uh, reads, um, and everybody in my household uh, reads um, mandatorily i've told them to, to read all my letter to law students that might be the reason why they ignore me from now on but i've told them they have to read it because you know at least somebody ought to be reading it so the last last uh, uh, my latest letter to law students and uh, this passage although the passage i'm going to give you is slightly uh, longer right and there they are okay somebody else is reading it good so let me give you this passage right now this passage is there you are this is a passage now this is a passage on uh written by the philosopher i was mentioning ronald walken and this passage is talking about what kind of theories explain the value of politics so it's about the question of um of why should we have politics in the first place? Why, why is it the case that there should be a politician or a set of politicians who regulate our lives? Right. This is what this paragraph is talking about. Why should why why should we all subject ourselves to political regulation to some some other person trying to regulate our lives? And and this is a passage. Now this passage is slightly complicated, um, but nothing. Nothing very, nothing very difficult. Not 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 that difficult to understand. So, could you please read this and uh, and let me know, uh, let me know what your thoughts are, um, especially especially the ones, uh, the last four lines. Right based theories, however, treat course of conduct. The last four lines, starting from there. Right, just let me know what your thought, thoughts are. So just read this for a couple of minutes, and uh, then I'm going to talk about it with you.
Okay. Any any thoughts? Come, don't worry. I mean, this is not an exam. So, any thoughts come to your mind when you read this? Anything? Any? Can I do? You, if it helps you, uh, you know what I'll do. Uh, let me close this because I want to see you when I'm talking to you. So, let me just close this, and I'll tell you what I'm what I'm trying to get at. Right. So, this is. Let me tell you. I hope all of you have at least got some look, just a, like a preliminary look, right? Don't don't worry. It's not. A, I mean, you know. You have to come to my legal philosophy cl classes to get the kind of the full brunt of my treatment. So don't worry. This is not. This is just a light uh, introduction to the subject. Don't worry. This is what that passage is trying to get at. Right? <clears throat> it's saying, look, there are two ways in which uh, we need uh, politicians, rulers, politicians, political community. Two ways in which one, if there are no politicians, then we will just keep doing evil things to each other because we are. Humans, we are prone to, you know, things, right? We are, and and it's it's understandable. I mean, this is a very powerful theory, and it's been at the heart of law and politics so far. Um, you know, left to ourselves, we will pillage, uh, rape, kill, um, f commit fraud on each other, steal. Uh, we'll do a host of things, right? And so, what we do is we create a political community that creates a code of conduct for us. Right? And we are ourselves not capable of creating this code of conduct. Uh, we are not angels, right? So we need a code of conduct. Uh, even angels, in fact, need a code of conduct uh, because angels may not know how to pay taxes. So we need some code of conduct, even for people who are generally good, right? But never mind them. There are also lots of people who are not good, right? Uh, and we need, therefore, a code of conduct to ensure that um, the society is regulated by this kind of list of duties that people have. This list of duties that we see is the law. Right? The law around us creates a list of duties. There is an Income Tax Act. There's a Companies Act which says, Income Tax Act that says pay taxes like this. It calculates the taxes for you after a discussion in the great representative parliament that we have. Or you have a corporate law that tells you these many meetings you need to have in a year, you need to have independent directors on the board. Or you have a maternity benefits act that makes sure that if, uh, uh, if a woman is not able to come to work because of uh, pregnancy, she, she is then benefited. Uh, so it, you can see a host of, I'm just giving you a range of circumstances in which you can see duties that we owe each other are enshrined in a code of conduct and enforced by the politicians. This is a lesson that's familiar to us because that's what we learn in school right from the beginning. Anybody who goes to politics class will learn Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. And if you keep Rousseau aside, Hobbes and Locke follow the same story, right? You know, people are killing each other, people are pillaging each other, and then you have politics comes in and things get settled because now there's a code of conduct, and that code of conduct is followed by the rest of the society. But I wonder, is that what politics is for, right? I mean, that's what people think politics is for. I would say, what if we don't, what if we think that politics is basically not so that the politicians can help us um, commit to our duties? If I think, no, that's not the reason. I think politics might be because we are prone to have some set of people who coerce us, namely the politicians, right? And we got to do something so that these politicians are restrained in their efforts to coerce us. You know? And those are known as rights. Right? So politics is basically a set of thugs usually take control wherever you go. You know, There's hafta by the thugs and there are taxes by the sophisticated thugs. Right? And what happens is they're going to catch you and they're going to, at every opportunity, try to coerce you. And the only thing that's preventing them coercion the only thing that's coming between you and these people are the law, which is basically rights, right? So the idea here is that um, the law is meant not so much to create and regulate duties of conduct on us, but it is in, to ensure that people in a community uh, treat each other with dignity that I'm not able to, at a my whimsy, go and kill you or put you in prison or do bad things to you because I need to respect you as a person, right? And if that is how you want to think of the law, then law as a code of conduct is no longer relevant. 
I mean, a code of conduct, whatever parliament passes, enacts, it's a set of instructions that a judge has to ensure at the ground level, when the rubber hits the road, as we say, at the ground level, we need to ensure that somebody's dignity and somebody's rights are being protected, right? I gave this example of this text that are there in my letter to law students as an example of a mind-blowing text. You know, something that kind of, when you read it, changes. <laughs> I suppose so, yeah. Sorry, I'll keep laughing between the look at the comments, right? So, yeah, I mean, the idea here is coercion at all levels, Ashish, right? The idea here is when we talk to each other, or when, we, when, when the law is trying to regulate our activities, the law is not trying to tell us this is what you ought to do. It's telling us in whatever whatever person does, he or she has to respect the rights of others. Right? And those are very two different ways of looking at the law. Right? In the first paradigm, the duty-based law, legislature is paramount. Right? It, it enacts a law or any lawmaking body is paramount. And the judges are just subsidiary. You know, Judges are enforcing the law or they are filling in the gaps. Right? In the other paradigm, in the paradigm of rights, judges are in the main the most important people because all your codes of conduct and regulations are all not, you know, not really important except when they're applied to particular situations. And those applications, of, I'm using judges in a very wide sense, by the way. So I'm saying judges could be uh, your munsifs, your district collectors, um, your grievance officers in universities, since Ashish gave the example of professors. So it could, be, it could be anybody who's applying, who's making sure that the law is protecting rights. Now, we have gone far away from the point of my second point, which was that the first one was philosophy makes things interesting and accessible. Second thing is philosophy can take you to the heart of any subject matter and change your perspective on it completely. Right. So for me, this text changed my perspective, went to the heart of the subject matter, and it changed my perspective on the law. It changed the way I look at the entire domain of the law. Right? It changed the way I look at what I say in tax law, or what I say in corporate law, or what I say in constitutional law. Similarly, there could be perspectives in economics, which will change the way you deal with all aspects of economics, right? where, you, where you start thinking very differently about a certain area of economics, because you, you kind of understood or you, you change your mind on a certain idea. That uh, that process of something going to the heart of the matter, fundamentally changing your idea, is the reason why people study philosophy. So that's how a philosopher has the tools uh, and the ability to do that, right? If not for Dworkin saying those things about codes of conduct, uh, we won't even understood why the judiciary is an important, uh, such an important Body. And I should, shouldn't keep mentioning judiciary, I should say judicial function, right? And I, and I keep, in fact, I've written, all, uh, I've written a, a paper uh, that uh, <clears throat> has mostly gone unread, unfortunately. But it's a paper that in which I have uh, made some radical suggestions about, uh, about the judiciary. And my whole point was in India, because we are kind of wedded to the first model of code of conduct, and therefore, we are kind of in separation of powers. We kind of made the legislature and the executive more important than the judges. We are not able to enforce rights or, in fact, respect rights in the way we ought to. So the, just the fact that there is some torture in a police station in Basta um, takes years to reach the Supreme Court. Right? And so that torture, that, that um, site of human activity where there's been a violation of human dignity goes unanswered for several years. You can't have that in a society. Right? That, that that that's not what we are in a in a political society for. We need a completely different system. We need an exercise of judicial function at the site of the violation of human dignity, not in the, a Supreme Court in Delhi. Right? So that it has so what Walkin has said in that has got important implications for the entirety of the legal domain that uh, that we live in. And similarly, for you, my second point is that philosophy uh, will have important implications, uh, not just um, fundamental important implications, that throw light on the domain in entirety. Right? And that's why you should study philosophy. Without studying philosophy, you can't be doing that. Right? You, can't, you can't then ever change your perspective. Whatever you're going to be doing, you're going to be doing within the worldview of what others have been telling you. 
and and then you will never be able to reform the subject or be able to you know throw your mind. Yes, yes, Ashish. Uh, Shashank had a question, so he had raised his hand. If you don't. Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. Question. Yes, of course. Yes. So on the point you raised about uh, respecting rights, so uh, the question I want to ask is. Um, whether our actions so what do we do uh, if if i want to harm someone not harm someone should i respect the law or the natural instinctive motive to not do it because well, so see. no the, so if if i start i mean as you said there is a distinction between revering that co code of conduct and doing things because they are right in themselves but if i start doing what i think right and you start doing what you think right then we are again in this tussle of what is actually the right thing to do so uh, in that case i mean as kant says it all of us i mean dignity is whole and soul it derives its or uh, value from the moral worth of your actions so you are doing it only because you have reverence for the code of law uh, you're talking about kant yeah oh okay no yeah kant is a different i mean you know uh, so Kant is a different. Let, let let's focus on your, on the first part of your your uh, your your question, which is that um, without a code of conduct, are we not all at sea? Because we each have our own versions of what we think is right or wrong. That's that's what you're trying to say, right? Correct, Shasha. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I think that uh, even in a rights based framework, uh, you're not uh, you're not completely uh, adrift. Uh, in many cases, you, your ideas of what is right or wrong will more or less coincide with other people's ideas of what is right or wrong. Too much is made out of this idea that society will descend into chaos uh, if people are left to interpret or do things on their own. I think both of both you and me can recognize certain violations as violations of dignity and certain violations are not violations. For the most part, I mean, there may be some differences between you and me. But um, for the most part, I don't think that we'll, we'll uh, uh, devolve into chaos um, because each of us has an autonomy of understanding what is uh, right or what is wrong. So uh, th there could be, a, uh, by the way, a code of conduct in order to benefit us. So there could be a code of conduct you and I both agree. So we agree in our co colony here, RWA, Resident Welfare Association. We agree on a code of conduct here, right? And the code of we don't agree because it's a some kind of you know God-given duties uh, that we have to walk on the left side of the road only, uh, or we have to only walk in one direction so that we don't run into the cars. We do it because it is benefiting everybody's rights, and we are able to do it because our idea of what walking um, in on the left side of the road is coincidentally the same as other people's ideas of what is walking on the. Everybody knows what a left side is. So um, I don't think that's an issue. Now, you may have a bigger point, which, which uh, the first uh, questioner also asked, which is, <clears throat> um, where does this end? If, if, uh, if, if philosophy is making us think about our rights and duties autonomously, uh, will there not be, I mean, will there not be some conflict? I mean, is, is it not the case that um, uh, disagreement leads to uh, a lot of confusion. Uh, in fact, this is what Locke and Hart have been saying: the disagreements lead to confusion, and therefore we need the the code of conduct. That brings me to my third text and my third point. So my first point was philosophy is interesting. Second point: philosophy will lead you to understanding something fundamentally, and which might then lead you to kind of reimagine the entire domain in which you are. And my third point, which as in a suspenseful way, I will not mention immediately until you read the text. I'll uh, I'll tell you what the third point is. Once again, my unfortunately, I'm I'm in a hurry to, because of the because of my uh, kind of change timing. So sorry, uh, excuse me, Ashish, for that hurried. Uh, I was going to dwell even more dramatically on the third point, but uh, because of this time limitations, uh, I had to hurry up a little bit. So let me just uh, tell you what my third point. Right. So this this is the third that I wanted to read. This is again another one written by Ronald Walken. And uh, uh, just read this please for two minutes, and then I'll, uh, I'll I'll talk about it with you. 
Let's read this for two minutes, please. May I uh, ask a question? Sure. Uh, so again, I'll. Uh... No, I mean the question is clarificatory. I just want to make sure I understood the last sure, sentence. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So is the last sentence really just saying that the means justify the ends? Is that a correct interpretation? Sorry, in this paragraph. In this paragraph, the last sentence. The second yes. is a further assumption that the requirement of courtesy. Yes. And from there on in, is that really just saying that the means justify the ends, and therefore? No. Even if you don't agree with the means, you should still. Um... No, 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 no. The second. Okay. So the second. Uh, uh, let me clarify that. So the second uh, assumption is, is just saying that our ideas about what a practice requires, in this case, a practice of courtesy, should be sensitive to our idea of what the value of courtesy is. It should. It should correlate to that. Suppose we say, let me give you an example here. Suppose we say that the value of courtesy is showing respect to somebody. That's all, showing respect, right? If that is the value of courtesy, then whatever we think is the requirement of courtesy must be related to showing respect to other people. So that's the value of courtesy. So um, let me stop sharing and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you guys about it. Right? Okay, so the, the reason I'll tell you now the third point of why we should study philosophy, in my opinion, is because, um, and this is in fact the one thing in, uh, on which I always have puzzles with my students, um, because my students, um, you know, come from an education system where um, they believe that um, if people disagree about something, there must not be any truth to the matter. Right? So if you and I disagree, about uh, courtesy, about what courtesy is, means that there is no truth to the matter on any matter of courtesy. It's your opinion, my opinion. And, and uh, I don't know why they've got into this mindset, right? But this is one mindset that I think we must challenge as philosophers. Right? So the one way of challenging this mindset is to say to people, in the way Dwokin mentioned here, and I'll just repeat that so that everybody's on the same page. Right? We look at practices, practice of courtesy in the example given there, but it could be practice of anything, practice of politics, practice of um, economic management, uh, practice of medicine. We look at any practice and the participants in the practice. Uh, we have always assumed that there is some kind of objective, uh, objective requirements of the practice that everybody agrees on and then the practice goes forward. And Walken is saying that's not the case. Take courtesy, for example. In courtesy, what is actually happening is that it's a practice where people think being courteous to others has some value. But not only that, the value that people think courtesy has leads them to understand what courtesy requires in particular situations. Right? So, for example, uh, if I'm sitting in a train or a bus and we have an army veteran come in, do you stand up for it? Right? And you stand up for perhaps you're chivalrous and you stand up for women, 
but do you stand up for an army veteran? Right? And, and some people will say, I'm not going to stand up just because somebody is in the army. And then you say, well, that's not being courteous. Now, how do you how do you debate with each other? How do you understand without, without punching each other? How do you ensure that you, you talk to each other in a sensible manner? Right? And you say, well, <clears throat> I say, well, let's agree that courtesy means respecting people. And therefore, in this case, we should respect somebody who has um, sacrificed for the country. So the argument here is that you, the participants in the practice are talking up with each other. They're actually dealing with each other in a civilized way because they understand that that practice has some value and that the requirements of the practice in particular situations is sensitive to that value. And Walken says, this is, Walken just gives you an example of courtesy, right? But it could be any valuable practice in society. Now notice how far reaching this idea is because this idea then appears and this is why I told both the students who talked to me just now, I told them that, you know, hang on to this, right? This idea seems to suggest that there is much more widespread disagreement on various aspects in society than what we have previously assumed, right? Anything. And I think economics is a good domain for this, right? I think that too much is made of economists, uh, you know, being there being a lot of orthodox in, uh, in economists. In my opinion, even in the economic domain, there should in fact be widespread disagreement following this theory. In fact, on basic concepts of economics, basic understandings, there must be widespread disagreement. Right? Of course, that doesn't mean that everything's chaotic. It just means that each person in the domain is saying this practice is valuable for this reason. And whatever we are talking about should be sensitive to that value. We should be talking about it in terms of that value. Right? And that's how they debate with each other. Right? So my third lesson for you is that philosophy is important because philosophy makes you understand that there is widespread disagreement on the application of value in any practice. Right? And therefore, the, our uh, practice is fundamentally argumentative. Now, when I say this to my students, they say, of course, you're going to say that you're a lawyer. You know, you're just born to argue. And I tell them, no, it's not because I'm a lawyer. It's because the idea here is that in most practices in society, and definitely anything to do with morality and ethics, right? There is widespread disagreement on what is needed. Uh, courtesy is a very simple example. If you're if you're disagreeing on courtesy, can you imagine how much more you will disagree on how to regulate welfare benefits, on how to ensure that there's a trade-off between expenditure on army and expenditure on health, right? Uh, how much you will disagree on vaccinations and government's policy towards vaccinations. I had to push that in because Murli is here. Right? So, and, and so, so when Murli makes an argument, in uh, when, when Murli goes on TV and makes an argument, he's not making an argument that what I'm saying is enshrined as an objective code here. What he's saying is he's saying there's a value to this practice and he's making an argument about how, what those values are require us to do something. Right? And of course, he agrees. Murli will agree that other people will disagree with him. That doesn't stop him from arguing. So my, my issue with young kids are that my kids will come and say, um, if there's disagreement, that means we are, I mean, there's no point. There's no point arguing with each other. Right? Because there's no truth to the matter. We all disagree with each other. And the idea of philosophy is to say that most matters of ethical and moral concern are fundamentally argumentative. You'll be making an argument. You'll be, put, you'll be putting forth an opinion. You'll be making a judgment. You'll be using, in other words, your mind, right? And, and making fundamental judgments. And those judgments, you may never come to an agreement with each other. Right? Then my, uh, when, when I say this, my, my students say, I, I mean, then what's the point? We just keep fighting with each other. But there's no, uh, there's no point to this. And I say, look, in 1850s America, in 1840s and 1850s America, there was no agreement on slavery. That didn't prevent Lincoln from making a point, right? saying that, no, this is what my opinion is, and please follow me. Right? So it's not as if there's no point uh, to this argumentative character of society. Right? But the point, the first point to recognize is because when I start my class in, when I uh, start my class in legal methods or jurisprudence, uh, students ask me, can you just give me some five points on uh, what is meant by um, critical legal theory or what is meant by positivism? Uh, and I say, I'm not going to give you five points. 
I mean, that's that's in fact going against the very way of doing philosophy. That we, we've got to understand philosophy from the inside and make it try to understand what the value of that practice is and then try to figure out what follows from that value, right? In the way uh, Dworkin analyzed Curtis. So I'm, I know I got about five minutes left. So any any questions? Sorry, I've been talking for too long. Okay. And I know that a lot of people had questions from the the chat box. So I don't know that I'll be able to. Uh, so uh, Murli's question was: Do we need religion to make us good human beings for us to recognize morality? I mean, <laughs> it's a, it's a question that I think everyone has to answer for themselves. I I, I don't think that uh, religion is needed to make us good human beings. Um, uh, I think that you can be, uh, you can be um, ethical and believe in ethics as, um, as a real subject uh, without uh, at the same time being religious. Um, uh, in fact, there's a famous course in Harvard called, uh, the course is titled, if there is no God, then is everything possible or if there's no god is, is can we do anything we want to so mm -hmm. and i think that's similar to this question that you're that you're asking um should hate then jelen has asked should hate speech be protected then does hate speech serve any positive function in, in social order so we can make an argument that um, the fact that we can be argumentative does not mean that we can indulge in hate speech and hate speech in fact in some cases Maybe violative of rights. Anybody who's inter who is a big partisan of rights, though, will be a big partisan of being very liberal about hate speech, because um, otherwise you kind of hit at the very argumentative character of practices. So that's the reason why in America uh, there is no Holocaust denial laws, and in Europe there is Holocaust denial laws. Right? So in America, you can make a fool of yourself, saying all kinds of fancy completely useless things but they say you know who knows you may make a good point at some point from your life so let's allow that um how do we accommodate the differences in what is considered right and wrong among different religions and i said this is where it's an arg argumentative practice that we need to develop that we have in fact Dworkin's point is not that we need to develop it this is how we are right? we just haven't recognized it <laughs> uh yes Really, I realize it now, and uh, and uh, uh, that's right. Um, your, uh, I'm not familiar with the works of John B. Sorry. Uh, and the last question is: uh, If Schopenhauer had been alive now, could he be cancelled? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I need to know a lot more about what you mean to answer that question. Uh, and Ashish, did you have any questions? Oh boy, uh, answer them. Maybe uh, what we could do uh, is have you back for a follow-up session if you can make the time, because not just me, I'm sure, it, just given the list of questions over here, they're all dying to ask you questions. Oh, I would love to. Look, um, I, you're, you're like, a, a, like a, a pressure release point for me after after the series of meetings in the week. So so no, <laughs> no, no, no worries on that front. Because you need to leave at five. Yeah, sorry. Today I have to uh, leave at five, unfortunately. Um, and uh, otherwise, I would love to carry on the the, the discussion uh, anytime. So I can. I'm I'm uh, I'm happy to come back and, and uh, talk to you uh, and your students anytime you want. We'll we'll hold you to that. So I'll I'll follow up with an invitation along with Rahul. And maybe the next session could just be a question answer session based on what we learned today. Sure, that that's fine with me as well. Lovely. Awesome. Thank, thank you, you so much, Professor Nigam. Thank you very much, thank all you of you. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how do I pronounce your names? Shaili? Shaili. Thank you, Shaili. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you, you Ashish. And um, thank you, Murli. And thank you, my, my dear students. I, I, I couldn't answer all of your questions, but we'll, uh, I'm definitely, we'll, we'll definitely catch up sometime. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much. You too. Bye-bye.